And today we're going to talk about green roofs, walls, and bioretention ponds. Um, my hope is, is that this won't be too dull. I do have video. I tend to find that presentations that can go on a while, they, it's nice to have uh, another voice. And I really do think that sustainable landscaping is something that is really something more than just here in our local community. It's all over the world. So you'll see that I have um, some videos from places from Canada, places from here, um, but pretty much anywhere in the country that uh, I'm hoping that you find really quite interesting. So the first thing I want to do is kind of give you guys a green roofs overview. And I know because you're master gardeners, you guys probably know quite a bit about this, but just in case, this is a, unfortunately doesn't come across well with Zoom um, with all the computer stuff, but it, it does help um, people to understand a little bit of an overview, it's sort of a 101 on green roofs. For those of you who are newcomers to green roofs, here are some basics you should know. Basically, green roofs are engineered vegetated roof covers with plants and growing media, or the engineered soil, taking the place of a regular concrete tile or shingle roof. All roofs are designed to shed water and keep the building dry, right? Well, green roofs are no different. The most important aspect is that they are living, breathing roofs planted with many types of vegetation. Green roofs have been around in various forms since the fabled hanging gardens of Babylon through Scandinavian sod homes to the elaborate Rockefeller Center roof gardens built in the 1930s. The birthplace of modern day green roof technology is Germany, where these engineered systems were developed and have been tested for over 35 years, and where there's a lot of government support too. So imagine a lasagna-like layered system of materials covering the roof, engineered to keep the roof watertight and create an environment for plants to thrive. Here are a few representative material sections for a typical conventional or built-in-place green roof. These are complete systems for one-stop shopping where the companies offer warranties but you can also custom design one too, specifying the individual components. The number of layers and the placement vary from system to system and green roof type, but at the very least, all green roofs include a single to multiply waterproofing layer over the roof deck, drainage, a filter fabric, growing media or the engineered soil, and the most exciting part, the plants. Another way to create a green roof is with a modular system, which are individual trays set side by side on top of a watertight roof. Another modular option for planting your roof is to use very lightweight, thin mats, which are fully vegetated with low maintenance sedum and moss plants. They arrive rolled up and are installed like sod. There are advantages to all types of systems, hybrids, and custom designs. And in terms of design, there are two main types of green roof assemblies extensive and intensive although a green roof is often designed with features of both. Also called eco roofs, extensive green roofs are thinner, lighter, and less expensive. They are used when the primary desire is for an ecological roof cover with no or limited human access. Extensive green roof plants must be high heat, drought, wind, and frost tolerance, self-regenerative in nature, and overall have low maintenance requirements. Typical plants are alpine ground covers like succulents and some flowering herbs, called grasses and mosses. Media depths range from one inch up to about six inches, and saturated weights start at about 17 pounds per square foot. Generally, extensive green roofs can be installed on slopes up to about 30 degrees, although there are green roofs with much higher pitches. Intensive green roofs, on the other hand, are more intricate and lush, and much heavier and deeper. They look more like a traditional roof garden because they are built on relatively flat roofs, and a much wider variety of plants can be used like flowering shrubs, vegetable gardens, and even trees. Architectural accents like waterfalls, ponds, and all sorts of recreational areas are possible with an intensive green roof system. And of course, initial costs and maintenance requirements will be higher. Green roofs are a form of low impact development and mitigate the negative effects of a building footprint by somewhat recreating lost green space at roof level. Green roofs are used as stormwater management and act like sponges by absorbing rainwater slowing and cooling it down as well as releasing cleaner runoff. They create a healthier environment by filtering air and binding dust particles, absorbing CO2 and other pollutants, and lowering ambient temperatures, which then lowers the urban heat island effect with living, breathing plants through photosynthesis and evapotranspiration. Since living roofs are covered with engineered soil and plants, they keep the area under them cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter, reducing both heating and cooling energy consumption and cost. And because materials are buried, the green roof protects 
structural elements from UV rays and wind and temperature fluctuations, which in turn help to double, triple, or more the life of the roof. So maintenance and avoidance costs are also avoided. Another major benefit is that planted roofs reintroduce flora and fauna into the concrete jungle and supply nesting and habitat areas for displaced pinched birds and other wildlife. They also provide acoustical insulation and noise protection and even reduce glare. Also, thanks to the marketing and goodwill opportunities for companies and governments to lead the way with ecological design. And very importantly, green roofs create new real estate by taking advantage of the usually forgotten and unused zip facade of the building, its roof. Okay, um, so that was really just an overview to give you everything about a green roof in a nutshell. And my hope here is we're going to kind of go a little bit more in depth, but not for very long, because we've got, I think, more exciting things to look at. Um, I do have to apologize. I do have a lot of commercial type of applications in this, but I do start to get a little bit more into more residential. A green roof, as you're, I'm sure, aware, is not something you standardly see here in the States um, in a residential uh, environment, but we are starting to see some homes being designed by architects that actually are either built into the earth um, for sustainability purposes as well as for uh, minimal HVAC needs um, and, and energy in general. Um, we're starting to see more and more of those, but mostly it, it's taken care of by commercial. So the type of systems as it had originally said in, in the video is we've got extensive green roofs semi-intensive green roofs, which they weren't talked about, and intensive green roofs. Each one of these has a different application, and we're going to start with extensive green roofs. Um, basically, these ones are ones you've seen quite a bit of. This is probably the one you're most aware of that uh, would be on the majority of the commercial um, buildings. They're also the ones you see fail the most as well, because a lot of people don't understand that it's all about the plants when you do the, the extensive green roof. If you don't plant the right ones that can actually truly hold the water and only let it go at night and it really be something that's more like the succulents and almost the cacti, the, the extensive green roofs really tend to fail because it doesn't necessarily need irrigation. And a lot of places that want these green roofs don't necessarily have the right structure to be able to handle the excess of water that might be needed for just your standard plant. So this one has a small little video that I do want to show you that's specifically about extensive green roofs and how that all works. The Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center in Austin, Texas installed the first extensive green roof in their area. I visited with the Director of Landscape Restoration, Steve Windhager, to find out how they designed their rooftop garden. Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center is all about native plants, using them in gardens, landscape restoration, or even on rooftops. And what we're looking at right now is seeing how native plants can be used in green roof applications, particularly on commercial buildings. Can you tell me about the structure that's underneath this? All these rooftops are lined with a standard metal frame uh, under the corrugated aluminum rooftop. Under that, we have a waterproofing membrane that keeps the insides dry. That's on top of the metal. That's on top of the metal. Then on top of that, we have a, a sheet of foam and then another weatherproofing membrane. And then we put all the, the soil and then the plants. So the media, the soil is about how thick. It's about four inches thick. It's the most economical and this is what most commercial applications are looking for. And clearly the biggest question is going to be, will this roof leak? These roofs are less likely to leak than any other kind of roof. What goes on underneath the soil membrane is exactly what you find under a standard rooftop. And then we put on the soil, which makes it actually less likely to be close to the elements, to crack, to wither, and to become stressed. And that's what actually causes those rooftops to leak. So what are the benefits of having a roof like this? They have a lot of benefits, but for starters, they're great in terms of reducing the heat island effect. All those rooftops reflecting a whole bunch of sunlight can cause urban areas to really heat up. These green roofs do a great job of mitigating against that to help lower the overall ambient air temperature. They're also great in terms of cooling the building if they're on top of it. Four inches of soil is a great insulator, and it keeps the occupants of the building at a much cooler temperature. And then the final benefit, of course, is wildlife. This is a great wildlife habitat for a number of different birds, insects, and other species, and it creates an urban oasis. Remember, there are lots of healthy choices for you and the planet. So if you're going to build it, build it green. Our next one is a semi-intensive green roof. And what this one is, 
is a little bit more of a heavier type of soil. It allows the um, landscape architect or gardener to be able to select more types of plants that would have a much more aesthetically pleasing kind of a look. It also multiple heights. Um, this one would require probably a little bit of irrigation because of the selection of the plant. It tends to get a little bit deeper and it requires more structure on the, the building to be able to handle something like this. These ones also tend to bring in a little bit more in the weed department. You're gonna have to go out there and uh, pick through because they don't necessarily need to have plants that fill in quickly. There are some companies that actually create trays where when they show up on your site for home or commercial, they're already fully grown. So when they place the um, extensive green roof, down, the plants are already full. There isn't any place at all for weeds to actually grow. And they become really a low maintenance type of a root, which is really outstanding for the whole point of sustainable landscaping. Um, so a semi-intensive is sort of a mixture and it allows a little bit more variation in the plant selection. And then we have the intensive green roof. And this would be familiar to everyone when you think about the top of commercial buildings or hotels, there's even some places around the world that have golf courses that span across their entire campus and it's where the buildings connect and they're able to, which seems strange, shoot a golf ball. They're normally glass buildings. Hopefully they'll be good golfers and they won't hit the glass, but they can jump from one building to the other. But they're deep enough that they allow full grown trees, canopy trees and evergreen to be grown. And these absolutely need irrigation. The are the roofs on these are pretty much designed to, you could land a plane on them. They're extremely heavy. They're meant to be um, something that can actually hand more, handle more wind and even snow because it would actually stay there longer because it's actually going to be in more in shade environment. So we don't have the same, I guess, case you would say in, in more of an extensive roof because it's wide open without any shady areas at all. So this one is it's really outstanding. Even when you want to have a rooftop farm, you can do that in these areas because of the depth of the plants and the fact that there is irrigation involved, but it's extremely expensive. Um, then we have what, with the green roof, there's really the aesthetics. They're, they can absolutely be stunning around the world and on the top of a roof or even your home. If you have a home that has multi-stories and any part of it is flat roof, it's amazing to be able to walk out from a second story onto the or from the third story out onto the second story or even second to first and be able to go out onto your own patio have screens you can even put out you know a, a table and chairs and just enjoy being up in the sky with no visible buildings around you and you feel that you're in the clouds but you're still in a beautifully landscaped area so aesthetics is really a huge thing about green roofs so we've got all different types of applications as you see in the, the top right corner is really more of the intensive type of a green roof where it's actually used and it's used by the public. You've got pagodas up there and then beautiful uh, landscaping that is there uh, all year round. And what can be incredible about them is they can be in areas where you can even get fall colors on these. Obviously we wouldn't here in Michigan want to use it in the winter, but we can still enjoy the benefits of all those beautiful um, colors if the, the plants are selected correctly for spring, summer, and um, autumn. Here, they can be amazing. The, um, the lower right hand one is actually something that's incredible. Hayworth over on the other side of the state did a building similar to this where it was the lawn literally went up and covered the whole roof just like maybe half of the building there as you see this one was in Japan that you're looking at but Hayworth here in Holland I believe is where it's at did their headquarters and it, they mow it, it's amazing, but it's beautiful because it, is, it basically is the architecture blending into uh, nature. And it, it's a wonderfully gorgeous thing to look at. And it's not all this hard steel and concrete that you normally see with um, company headquarters. It's really a pleasing aesthetic. So basically, as you heard in the video, the environmental benefits of having a green roof is mainly, uh, or a large portion is really urban heat island mitigation. When you place plants up on a roof and it's not the black typical asphalt shingles that you would normally see, that obviously will heat up your house and it's your house, your building, anywhere. It's as if you know, you're standing on an asphalt parking lot and you can get a sunburn. So if you can imagine all that heat is going into your building, 
But if you put a green roof on it, you've now got a massive amount of insulation. You've also got those plants and, and in certain atmosphere or certain environments with the different types of roofs, you'll even get some shading. And as the um, gentleman said in the one video, that it actually helps to, to keep your roof longer. It's incredible how the environment will destroy your roof. Also, we have noise reduction, again, because of insulation aspects of the soil and even the roots so with the little bit of water that holds it in there. Uh, we have a massive um, reduction in the sound of anywhere around you. It's a huge benefit in urban environments um, to have any greenery placed into, let's say, New York City. All those parks that go along in there helps to really reduce quite a bit of sound. And if we added more green aspects as you go up or even on more balconies and in areas of that sort, it would even help to muffle some more of the sound. Fire prevention is actually something that people forget. When you have a green roof, you have such a compacted amount of soil and then the root systems get really good and tight. And then it's also because of the type of plants and the type of soil you use, there's quite a bit of water that's retained. These are nearly impossible to be set on fire. It's as if you're trying to set a phone book on fire thoroughly closed. It's a wonderful way to um, really be able to fend off quite a bit of uh, fire issues. And then uh, with that being said, the water conservation, the reduction of the stormwater runoff, it, it helps to really mitigate that. If you capture even the water in a rain barrel and then pump it back up, you can actually use it as some of the irrigation for some of the semi-intensive and intensive rain gardens. So there's lots of pluses in doing this. And then obviously the habitat recreation especially in urban environments where we're seeing like the, the migration of our monarch butterfly, you know, disappearing because there's no place to go. Well, by putting roof gardens up, we're able to maybe help some of these butterflies jump across the areas where we've actually gone and destroyed cities. If we start putting these roof gardens back up and planting those, those migration sites or even pollinators for birds, we'll be able to help bring back things that, you know, construction has destroyed. The hope is, is that we can blend together then the landscape architecture and architecture together to be able to not make that much disruption in um, our urban environments with the habitat. So just to do a quick little thing, the amount of heat gain in the building from an urban heat island mitigation is quite, it's, it's quite huge. So the three cool roofs that you see out there now are green roofs. And then you can coat your flat roofs with a white paint. It's as if you're wearing, you know, like white clothes out on a hot summer day. You're a lot cooler than black. And then using a vinyl roof instead of aluminum or even a bituminous type. It allows it to stay at consistent temperatures within the building. So your HVAC bills will be massively lower as a regular traditional roof. Um, and this is, you know, Ford Motor Company, the Rouge River plant. This is one of the um, things that they did that's massively lower the amount of urban heat gain that they have. And their HVAC bills are able to um, regulate the temper of the space on the inside because that massive, huge plane is covered in sedum. And that is an extensive green roof that they put in there. Then the noise reduction. There's multiple ways that we see things. This one building in the lower corner is in Japan. The whole face, the east, I believe it's the east or the south facing of this building, which is a stepped building. They designed it in such a way that they could add this, this huge sheet of greenery that helps to keep the sun out, but also keep the temperature, I'm sorry, it, it, but add the beauty to the outside of it. So you have aesthetics with this. And then the buses up above, it's just something unique. Obviously, I don't think it does a whole lot to the noise, but it's, it's an interesting thing to be able to think of how you can actually put a green roof on anything if you actually know how to plant. Um, water conservation, there's multiple ways that you can trap the stormwater uh, runoff. It's um, rain barrels with sloped roofs. You can do at home, on your shed, your garage. You can do quite a bit of that. There's also things where you're capturing it um, uh, by roof drains. Anything that is flows through and is not absorbed from the plants or from the soil, it actually can go down roof drain and then be captured and then recirculated to be irrigation. Um, and then there's ones in our larger parks where each individual planting bed, which is kind of a, when you're looking at the stepped gardens that go down to a bioswale or even one of those little pools, it's all about stormwater management. And each one of those can all be clipped together and we can create um, gray water. They can be used in multiple ways. And um, 
Then there's also rainwater treatment pools that you can set them up within these urban areas and clean the pollution. Like in, we, there's something in Southfield that they have a stepped, uh, I would say, I uh, forgot the name, I apologize, but it's a stepped area that basically filters the water for, of all the pollutants that come from the urban around, the environment, the cars, the runoff from the streets, from the oil and the gas, anything that's in there, all those toxins. They go through the roots of the, the plants. And then when it goes through the water, your water is even cleaner, it ends up coming out better, and then they're able to actually have that then safely run into our rivers and streams. And we need to be able to start thinking about that as we start to design all of our cities so that we can actually help to clean up all of our local tributaries that we have. The Rouge River, huge, desperately needs some help. Then the habitat recreation. It's it's just something that obviously I think as master gardeners, you guys think quite a bit about that, how to bring back you know, wildlife and soften up the environment, and then how do we not um, hinder what we have. So um, I'm gonna whip through the architecture and engineering because I think we kind of talked quite a bit about this and I don't think this is something you guys are all that interested in. So basically the built up of a green roof is multiple ways. You just have your roof, you have multiple liners, you have something that lifts up your dirt off of the, off of the um, roof surface that helps the water filter through so you obviously don't have root rot. Um, and then you have your vegetation. There's multiple ways to go about doing it. And then the benefits. The one thing that we can even do it in our homes that it, it's difficult for me to get a homeowner to understand, but the intake areas for your HVAC, if you can put vines around it um, and do things of that sort, you basically are, you pull the atmospheric air through those vines and it filters out all those toxins so that when it goes into your house, it's got really fresh, clean um, oxygen. And you have a much better interior environment if you set up plants in the right places. And then the, gr the green roofs, as we had said, that the angles of it can help with your HVAC system costs. So this, roof, this um, video is a home that I, I forgot, I think it's in Wisconsin. And it's really fascinating. It's an actual residence that was designed to have a green roof. And you can see how beautiful a green roof really can be if it's done properly and how it just really actually adds to the architecture um, in a positive way. Located in the Cincinnati suburb with four six floors and clear streams, the functional and highly aesthetic rehab of the Indian Hill House Green Room has been the top of the universe. Designed by Sky Studios and installed by Green City Resources, the homeowner desired a change to the vegetation on her existing green roof, which had been planted when the house was built in 2003. Inundated with weeds and invasive plants, the original green roof was not as striking as red it could be. Stry Studios decided on a firm monoculture block planting style in a curved linear design theme, better reflecting the organic nature immediately adjacent to the home. Nestled into a wooded hillside spanning a creek, the plantings located around the house are very naturalistic and free form in design. And since both the home and property were quite dramatic, the designers felt the green roof had to match the drama. Due to the roof consistent shallow soil bed depth, the team was restricted to using perennials, small glasses, and ground covers within six inches. They removed five truckloads of all biomass and added back a little soil in compensation. A lift could only reach the middle section of the roof, so the soil had to be brought up via bucket. Multiple groupings include coral forested feather reed grasses and native rubicia and coleopsis alongside upright sedum with mixed masses of three separate species of ground cover sedum. All have year-round interest with either a structural component or colorful features in the winter months. Toward the upper end of the roof is a steel mezzanine that is used to access the roof from the floors below. Fabricated aluminum vegetable boxes set in the upper roof provide an additional six inch of roof-like axe soil, bringing them up to 12 inch depth. 
a variety of tomatoes, cucumbers, squash, strawberries, onions, herbs, zinnias, and dahlias fill the boxes. And a soldier course of lavender phenomenon fills the roof edge. The cleanup of the green leaves isn't done until spring, leaving beautiful shades of amber for winter interest, and also giving aid to invertebrates and wildlife to nest. The Indian Hill House green leaf we have has been a wonderful accent to the contemporary Ohio home and an impressive addition to the overall feeling of the lushly wooded property, the result of a successful design and installation team. So the ideal plant that one would want to use in a roof, uh, green roof system is basically, it's a mix and it's a, a palette of deciduous, semi-evergreen and evergreen. And it's, um, you'll have to forgive me, I've been trying to remember how to pronounce it. Kreslothian acid metabolism, or CAM. And it's a particular type of plant that basically, um, typically your plants, um, uh, well, CAM plants are unique that in under drought conditions or leaf pores are open at night rather than during the day. And CAM plants exchange gases in the dark when it's cooler than, and less windy. Less water is lost in the calm night air, so CAM plants are up to 10 times more efficient with water conservation than non-CAM plants. And most plants perform their exchange as they receive sunlight during the day, and that's what makes the CAM plant so good, is that it allows, that's why your cactus and your sedum work so beautifully in a green roof system. Um, some of those examples, I just kind of picked out some of the plants that we've used in the past on green uh, roofs, and they're absolutely stunning. You can get um, beautiful spring, summer, and autumn colors here in Michigan just using some very simple plants, and you don't need many. You just need to get, as you know, your height and your colors and get your seasons going, and a green roof can just be stunning. Uh, additional components to a green roof are really, you can add your seating. You've got cavers that go along with it. You can enjoy it and walk it, and lighting, if you light it properly, it can just be a huge addition to any architecture. And then the irrigation system is something to think about. Um, obviously, bad installations, which I was telling you the ones that are mainly them, are the extensive green roofs. These are the ones that basically didn't have the right base or they basically planted plants that required irrigation or needed a much bigger depth. Um, or they didn't actually weed these. They could have been killed over by a pest, just so many things. So. It, it really has everything to do with the type of plant and soil that you do select, knowing that you're not gonna irrigate these. Like that standard root, uh, roof on that garage there wouldn't have been able to handle any irrigation. It would have probably collapsed. So this one is a living wall. We wanna talk about now the green walls, which are really kind of fun. And these you can do so much with. And this is really huge in residential now. Um, is used in commercial, but it, I found it more in residential. Appleton International Airport with airport code ATW in Appleton, Wisconsin, serves Northeast Wisconsin with flights to destinations around the world. As part of an FAA pilot program, Mead and Hunt developed their recently completed sustainability master plan designed beyond the lean climate certification, earning and designing an energy efficient building to exceed 70% of the current building code requirements. In February 2018, ATW completed the multi million dollar renovation and reconstruction of 50,000 square feet of its commercial passenger terminal. The goal was to improve customer experience overall, and a large light wall indoor living wall system was installed at the TSA checkpoint. Bringing beauty and calm, the new checkpoint features a three-sided 276 square foot green wall. Completed in August 2018, the living wall at ATW covers three sides of a structural wall plus a wrapped corner. In total, the wall includes 148 forward screen live wall modular plants for boxes. 
which are high impact UV resistant architectural quality molding. They contain reusable inserts that hold the glowing medium and contain a mix of five different indoor plant varieties. Need and hunt design open up and maximize the space in the security area and establish dedicated lanes entering the security line from the terminal and exiting to the terminal from the gate. Added glazing, both at the exterior and for interior partition, allows borrowed light to brighten the area. The living wall is situated at the end of the security line in the composure area where passengers can sit, put their shoes back on, and gather their belongings. The living wall complements these measures to calm and de stress the checkpoint. The side of the wall facing the gates, here with the adjacent video wall, welcomes arriving passengers. ATW says travelers are delighted with the green wall and see passengers taking selfies in front of it after they go through security. As a green feature, the live wall has a natural biophilic common effect. It signals to departing passengers that they can leave the stress of security behind them, relax, and look forward to their trip. And by increasing other sustainability measures and the use of renewable energy, the Appleton International Airport hopes to be carbon neutral by 2030, a goal achieved by very few airports. Okay, so there's multiple kinds of wall systems, and I'm gonna just kind of go through these pretty quickly. There's a pocket wall system that basically um, allows filtration from uh, the pollutants from the outside. It cleans through the, um, the uh, root system and the plants so that as it gets supercharged, it comes through into the building with fresh, clean oxygen. This is typically used with a drip system, and it's, uh, it's just a beautiful, almost an art element in um, buildings. And then there's the live wall system, which you saw before, which is actually something that's made here in Michigan. It's on the west side of the state. They have live wall and green roof, or, yeah, green roof. And they're one of the top people out there for this because their plants come based off of the location that you're actually planting your area. So you can pick and choose uh, plants that fit your region. Um, and then we have a cable and a grid wall system. This is typically one that's really their climber. So this is something you plant in the ground and then you're, you're creating a vertical system that also helps um, filter out uh, sunlight and help with your uh, UV rays and things of that sort. So installation, I, I'm not gonna bother to go through this. It's just a clip and rail system that um, they would use to be able to put some type of uh, a bucket system to one that will grow up the whole side of a building. So there's an installation which is really kind of interesting that a gentleman who did it in his um, coffee shop also went and did it in his home. And he did it almost like an eight foot high wall with a very different type of system that's all using uh, recycled plastic bottles. Hey gardening fans, it's Andy here. And today we are uh, on the road to my buddy's house to go check out something super cool. Now I'm excited about this because I've wanted to do this for a long time. Today is all about living walls. So uh, let's get at it. Welcome back to Garden Set. What's up, man? You're on camera. <laughs> I see it. So these are the pockets. Crazy. What are those made out of? Made from 100% recycled water bottles. What? That doesn't feel like a water bottle. I know. It's crazy. So it's a self-watering. Yeah. So they've got these little tiny little holes where the water comes out. So that'll go behind this. Through this guy. Oh, underneath I'm, this, that'll water cool. based on how often you take the water. Down here in the corner, we have a, a stubbed out for plumbing. As you can see, we just screw them into the wall. Pretty simple. The main thing is, is you got to get these things attached into, into some studs because they can hold up to 50 pounds each. So we put some backing board in, which that backing board attached to the studs, and then we can screw them in anywhere we want. A super important part of this, though, so make sure they are on the wall securely because there's going to be a lot of weight there. Jed's house is going through some pretty major renovations. They've added a second story, and while they did that, they fit in these giant windows, which is absolutely perfect for these wally pockets. I have no idea what 
know, and have the truth of the wall is plumbing and power. So if you're gonna do that, make sure you know where that stuff is. Okay. I think we'll go another probably uh, another six. Wow. But we'll, we'll also do um, we'll do one in the corner. So cool. we'll the corner all the way up. So now we're gonna go over to the store to check out um, the cool super the super cool installation of this living wall finish at the store. So each pot is filled with a, a very light, very airy soil. Okay. Okay, and then we draw behind here. Yeah. You okay. get the tubes going in behind the pocket there, and now the water will come out of these holes. Oh, cool. So there'll be one, at least one in each pocket. And uh, So does the hose go, is it, does it goes, saturate this bag? Is that how yeah. it works? Yeah. Oh, so okay. Behind the bag, you the rubber membrane behind Yeah, there's rubber back here. So that, that will kind of keep the moisture in, and uh, the felt will like, let the water go through. That's good stuff. So right here, this is the plumbing system. Oh, cool. Okay. So water goes in, and it's on a timer. Right. Out. Okay. And you can see it waters at um, 9 a.m. Yeah. And then closes at 9.01. Oh, cool. And then it waters at 6 p.m. and closes at 6.01. So fully automated, right? Fully automated. And you got some ferns in here. You got some spider plants. What do we got? What else we got? Is this like an eye, some kind of ivy here? Yeah. This is like typical yeah. spider plant growth where they have babies in trunks. You can just transplant those and, and make them a little bit bigger before you put them in the pocket. Well, thanks for bringing it over, man. There's your growing wall. Super cool. <laughs> So that is a really um, easy way for someone who's a homeowner to be able to put a live uh, wall in their house. Um, there's other uh, unique uses that basically is vertical farming. That's something that we've got um, our last video. We'll do a quick little thing about vertical farming. But this is one where it's actually the full building where it's entire floors and it's the skins of buildings. And then also art installations is another interesting thing just to be able to get moss and grass growing on the wall. Um, these are just some examples of some different installations that we have out there in the U.S. And then this one here, I will cut it short. It's a 10-minute video, so I just want to get you guys to get the gist. But this is something called, from Tower Garden, and it's pretty fascinating. It's your air um, and water system, and it's all vertical. And it's kind of a new way that people are, are starting to think about um, basically growing. So it's another version of a, a live wall, but this is actually specifically about farming. The crop planet are still running out of areas to grow food and we're running out of fresh, clean water to feed those crops as well. Your biggest issue here is what? Weeds? I mean, those weeds are tenacious, right? natural plant sweetener. There we go. The tower garden works indoors and works outdoors. You can pretty much grow anywhere on planet Earth. So what is organic beach? Know your farmer. Know where your food's coming from. Grow it yourself. You'll be healthy. You don't have to be an expert, but you can still grow your own clean, healthy food at home. My name is Troy Albright. I am a pharmacist and an urban farmer. We've tried to figure out, well, how can we grow our own food here in the desert? And so as we looked at different technologies, we realized water is going to be a commodity, and we investigated different ways to do it, and we decided that going vertical was way easier to do than going horizontal. So we can save 90% space by going vertical. We can use almost 10% of the same amount of land, but more importantly, we're using 90 to 98% less water. As I studied my patients, 
it came back to the foods they were eating were affecting their health. We're seeing a lot more disease in our society because of the things we're putting in our body, on our body. So I saw a chance to change the health of my patients by providing food to them. In Minnesota, we use lots of pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, to kill the weeds, to kill the bugs. And you know, we were told that that was the only way we could do it. And uh, you know, now we're finding out more of that exposure to pesticides, what that's doing to us. And so there's a big push to grow organically or the use without pesticides and herbicides and fungicides. And that's our goal, is to show people how you can do this in your own condo, your own apartment, your own house, your backyard wherever you have two to three square feet, that's all you need. It's designed for a third grader. It's meant to be kept simple. We have a reservoir that's 20 gallons that holds the water and the mineral nutrients. The water solution contains 70 plus essential minerals and nutrients, and the only moving part is a pump that pump, pumps that water nutrient solution up to the top, and then it rains down, and it hits each port, and we get faster growth. And we can have a full head of lettuce in 21 to 26 days from a two inch season. Beautiful root structure. You can tell the quality and the health of your plant by the roots and a beautiful bib lettuce. Chefs come into my greenhouse all the time and, and they'll say, well, there's no way you can grow enough food in this 5,000 square feet for me. Well, well, how many heads of lettuce do you go through a week? Oh, 50. I know that's one of my commercial towers. I have 320 towers at maximum production here. So I've got you know, one tower a week for you, but at least 316 more towers, what else? So we don't realize how much more you can grow vertically. Than oh, look at this, look at that beautiful pak choy. On the same tower, we're also growing some starver kale. Again, I never really liked kale, I started growing it. This is the starver kale, it's the sweetest of all the kale. Curly kale is another name for it. It has a lot of flavor as well. This area, we're fresh cutting for a restaurant in a chip. So, so the oregano is just incredibly close. You'll never have E. coli on this romaine. Beautiful romaine lettuce here. Nice and crunchy, got beautiful leaves. Really, really tasty. This has become my favorite lettuce from here. Mmm, you can just taste the freshness. Green onions, oh my gosh. Just this little piece of stevia, what stevia looks like, is enough to sweeten your whole smoothie. If you grow your own food, you're gonna be healthy. And that's what we're encouraging you to do. You know what's been sprayed on it, you know where it's gone through, like how it's been handled. That's the exciting part about growing your own food. These herbs. Okay. So, I, whoops, sorry, sorry, sorry. Ah, went a little far. <laughs> Apologize for that. So, that was basically just the new way that we're starting to see um, gardeners thinking about doing vertical um farming but it's also so sustainable because we don't have to deal with all those pesticides and all those things that then run off they go into our groundwater they just it's just so many horrible things besides all the animals that they're killing just to try to get more food to the table this way they they can bring things into areas where they couldn't uh really plant before now we can do full farming in desert with very little water then the last thing I'm gonna be talking about, and I'll be doing this quickly, is the bioretention ponds. This video is out of Canada, and it speaks so beautifully about what a bioretention is. And um, if this one goes a little long, I'll also stop it. But I think this is, we'll be wrapping it up with this pretty quickly. Oops, let's try that again. Nope. Here's what you need to know about bioretention from the Alberta Low Impact Development Partnership. Urban areas generate 20 times or more runoff than natural landscapes. Roads, lanes, and parking lots generate a lot of very dirty runoff. Bioretention areas can filter and cleanse large amounts of this dirty runoff in a small footprint using natural processes. You'll find them in the streetscape, as part of amenity spaces, in parking lots, everywhere runoff needs to be cleansed. So that makes up a bioretention area. In some ways, bioretention areas are similar to rain gardens. Both are planted depressions that drain within about 24 hours after rainfall stops. But to handle all that dirt runoff, bioretention areas use special soil for plants. When the subsoil is still drained well, an underdrain is added that ties into the storm pipes. Local flow may be added that can also tie in and tell me how deep water can pond before spilling. An inlet can take many forms and often has elements to slow down flows and trap sediment. 
and it all comes together like this. Runoff is absorbed into the soil after a gentle rain. In heavier rainfall, runoff will penetrate to the subterrain, with the plains runoff going into the storm pipes or infiltrating into the subsoil. In higher flows, runoff will reach the overflow. Okay, so just to wrap it up quickly, is there is here in Southfield, they're doing quite a bit of um, bioretention to help clean up the roads and all the other areas so that we don't have so much going into the um, Rouge River tributary. And then uh, using the pervious pavement system so that we can have beautiful greenery going down the roads without having to use um, any irrigation. And then local companies like Barton Mallow in conjunction with the Wildlife Habitat Council are creating rain gardens on their site. So I just wanted to wrap this up. I promised myself I'd do it under an hour and I think I've made it by seconds. So if there's any questions, feel free to ask. And if anybody has any questions or comments they wanna add, please feel free to unmute yourself or feel free to use the chat function and we'll see if we can get your questions answered. Hi, uh, it's Lucia Probst. I tried doing the, the living wall inside my apartment when I was living out of the country and uh -huh. it just kept dying and dying and dying. It could have been the uh, contraption that we used and I, I suspect because it didn't have a whole lot of soil and uh, we tried our best to water it but uh, it just wasn't very effective. We mostly just replant the plants. Well, what I found most is when homeowners are putting uh, live walls up, they get one the wrong soil and then they massively overwater it. So yeah, the thing that the water. Yeah, so, and that's where they end up having a problem is because it doesn't have the wind to help whisk away all of that, you know, the extra moisture. It's just sitting in there, and and because it's getting um, the sun's not really even hitting where the soil is. It's hitting the face of the plants typically. Again, it, it just, just sits there and it just rots and rots. And a lot of people don't realize those type walls need even less water than you would normally do for a house plant because you would have the right soil that would hold that moisture. And uh, it, it's a hard thing. And there's certain systems out there that have got it down. But again, it, it's all about the soil and the water. Okay. And some, obviously. No, you're welcome. Any other questions? I know I went on a long time and I apologize. Feel free to use the chat function as well if you're more comfortable with that or if you're having trouble unmuting, feel free to shoot me an email or use chat. Holly, your presentation was great. The pictures that you showed were really beautiful. Some of those I was sitting here thinking when I owned a home, if I could have done something like that, it would have been great. Well, thank you. I know it's a little bit more commercial than you're probably used to for these, but yeah, a landscape, it can just be just so beautiful. And it, again, I mean, you guys all being master gardeners, you know just what a plant can really do to just so many places. But this type of um, landscape, it, it's, it's, you don't see a lot of it. And it would be wonderful if there were you know, more of us that actually started to put that stuff in so that people can see the beauty of it. Yeah. How we so have thank you. Kind of a question too. Would you consider a bioretention pond is basically a rain garden by another name? Is that correct? It actually, it, it can be, but there are, a bioretention isn't necessarily the same as a rain garden. It does get used a lot in the same capacity as in, you know, try to change, um, using the same word for it. But a true bioretention is really about a place of say that's in a more of a commercial in, um, situation. You know how you get a lot of runoff from a parking lot and you see those big um, areas that are always fenced off and they tend to hold nearly a swimming pool amount of water. And they're not necessarily filled with plants, but they're starting to get more and more, people are starting to understand the type of plants that actually thrive in that environment. A rain garden on the other hand, is meant to be an area that's almost a stream-like type of thing filled with plants and there are a lot of times there's trees and it's more of a landscaped area at a, let's say a swale along a sidewalk but a, a true bioretention is meant to hold massive amounts of runoff and then allow it to drain 
fairly slowly through a root system, and it even has an overflow that does end up going back into the system. Um, but it, it's meant for really large water to clean up parking lots, really. Okay. It looks like we lost a ton of people. <laughs> I apologize. I've... No. <laughs> So oh, well, <laughs> I tried. Does anybody else have any questions or comments they wanted to add? Thank you for your time tonight, Holly. We really appreciate um, a great presentation and uh, taking your time to to educate us on some of these interesting techniques. Well, thank you very much for having me. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Holly. Thanks. Thanks. So just to, uh, hey, Julie, how many hundreds of people volunteered to be uh, the next uh, vice president or want to run? You know, Amanda, I saw that you you said that you would have step up and be vice president. Oh, <laughs> no, no, just uh, kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. I, I will let everybody know that um, Sally Boley will become the vice president and Julie Frome will continue on as the secretary. Okay. So I will have Sally send out an e-blast congratulating herself and Julie tomorrow. Okay. Thank Holly, you. Really quick, if you're still on, um, I just got one last question on chat. Um, somebody has a flat roof and they were wondering if they'd be able to convert that into a green roof. Yes, you would just need to be sure that you didn't do, a, a, if it's a standard flat roof, you're going to want to be sure you don't go any further than an extensive uh, green roof so that you can uh, be certain you're not going to have something collapse so that your structure below can actually handle it. And then you, you want to be sure you have good drainage off of it just in case we do get some seriously heavy rainfall. But absolutely, that's actually the perfect. What you want to do is line it like you think you're going to do uh, put in a pool and you should be good to go. Hopefully that answered your question. Um, and yeah, uh, for those people that are looking for the time for BMS, it'll be about an hour. And as Lucy has up there, it'll be under community beautification. Public. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next meeting is November 10th and we'll have Amanda Dang teach or uh, give a presentation about aquaponics. Thanks. That's all we have for tonight. You yeah. enjoyed it. Uh, send me any ideas you have for uh, other content that you want to cover during these meetings and send to Amanda anyone that you want to have come in to be a present presenter in a future meeting. Yeah. And Lucy and Amanda, thank you so much for putting these on. It's made it so much easier and I like that it's a presentation just to me so you can really hear the content of the speaker and see all the slides. It's worked out really, really well. Glad you're enjoying it. Yes. Me too. All right. Thanks, everyone. And have a great evening. All right. Again, Lucy, thanks for letting me know about everything tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, everybody. Talk to you next month. Yeah, put it down. November 10th. All right. Bye hey, I did, I did have it on my phone with an <laughs> alarm. I just had my ringer yeah. turned down because I was at the doctor's. <laughs> yeah. All, right. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. See ya. I forgot what's the category.